Greetings. Uh, thank you for joining us today. This is Caroline Staten with Transition US. And this is a wonderful online event we have today on Holacracy. Um, our principal aim for these online uh, teleseminars is really to provide practical support to the leaders of transition initiatives, those who are considering starting an initiative, and really community leaders everywhere that are working on resilience building within their communities. And we do want to continue to offer the webinars at no cost, but really ask you to consider making a donation. If this is valuable to you, please do consider making a donation. We have an easy to access donation button at uh, transitionus.org, and we really, really appreciate um, any help that you can give us. So um, let me now dive into our, our call today on Holacracy. And this is really focusing on you know, how to adapt your organization to be more agile in its environment, and even as it grows and scales. And are the roles within your organization, are they clear? Um, are they continually evolving? Are they driven by those doing the work? Is the work aligned with your organization's purpose? without egos getting in the way. So we're going to look at all of those things today. And our guest is Anna McGrath. And Anna is co-founder of WonderWorks Consulting and is a proven thought leader um, in this field. She's pioneered transformational business practices for over two decades. She's a dedicated agent's agent of conscious change, and she lives and breathes the values and practices of purposeful, positive impact. She's passionate about awakening individual engagement and supporting thriving, purpose-driven leaders and organizations through the holacracy operating system and governance structures. And that's what we'll be hearing about today. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Anna. And, um, and actually, I just recalled something. So let me mention first, go to the link on the website, transitionus.org. It's on our front page, the Holacracy link. It will take you to the page, and at the bottom of that page, are the handouts for today's call. The principal one we're using is the Holacracy webinar. The others are resources for you. So go ahead and do that. And um, Anna, over to you. Excellent. Thank you, Caroline. I really appreciate that introduction. And also, the, the, really the, the synergy of this community, the Transition USA community, um, I'm a Transition San Francisco uh, member who has not been very active, to be perfectly honest, because I've been uh, crazy busy with, uh, with Holacracy. But I actually love the work that you're doing and really appreciate you being willing to put this seminar on. So what are we talking to, about today? Well, Carolyn's given us a brilliant introduction to say what that's going to be. In fact, I think she was more concise than, than I would be. So at this point, I really... Um, want to give a shout out both to Caroline and to Maggie because these are the two people that I met at a previous workshop and it was actually about sociocracy and so I'm imagining if you're interested in holacracy you might also have been interested in sociocracy and um, it, it was fascinating kind of having an opportunity to to play with these guys in um, in that workshop to really see what are the differences why would you choose one why would you choose another um, but obviously today we're, we're really focused on what is holacracy. So I'll jump in. Um, we've got, obviously I love Maestro Conference because one of the things I struggle with about webinars sometimes is the, the lack of engagement. And Maestro Conference, by the way, is a holacracy user. And so I was very excited to see that Maestro is actually the, uh, the software that we're using for this call. So during this call, what I'd love to do is I always have a, a meeting norm, which is silence equals consent, meaning you understand it, it makes sense, you don't want to challenge it, you, you know, nothing's kind of bubbling up in you um, in the meeting. 
that you are not actually engaging around, sharing questions around, and kind of diving deeper to find more. So in this forum, you can actually, um, you can at different times, if you've got a question, you can put your hand up and you can press, I believe you know, it would be the same situation, you can press uh, one to say that you've got a question. And then when there's a few questions, what I'll do is I'll take a break, um, we'll go ahead, gather those questions, and I'll do that a few times during this session so that it's not just one-way communication, that we're, we're really getting down to what's relevant to this audience, what are the questions, and then redirect the, the material to, to really be um, more practical, more engaging, more fun for me, more fun for you is hopefully what, what will be the result. So that's kind of the logistical portion. I'll give you a little bit about my background just to say, you know, who am I? Um, I actually have had quite a diverse career uh, in different, I was in banking in England and also the US. Um, I was actually in sports management for a number of years. But throughout all of those experiences, I was always focused on leadership development, career development. So what happened back in the late 90s was I really got clear that why am I doing that in an indirect way? Why am I not doing that in a very direct way? How can I really support people to really love doing what they've got to do, living their purpose, and getting their work done in the world? So then I got very focused on, well, how am I going to do that? What does it look like? So launched um, WonderWorks back in 2003, was focused on conscious leadership skills. And I had trained for a number of years with the Hendricks Institute down in Ojai, California. Um, fabulous people, Katie and Gay Hendricks. And really dove deep into how do you really take these skills into organizations. And then, you know, love doing that work, uh, totally passionate, still doing that work with a focus on authenticity and how can we really show up as who we are at work. And then about I'd say about five years ago, I really got the, the inner seeker, got really kind of bubbled up again to say, you know, I love this work. It's powerful. However, there's something missing, and I'm not exactly sure what's missing. And then uh, about three years ago, I bumped into Holacracy. I was uh, in my seeker mode, and I could really see that now it was like, wow, I've got this structure, this system. The, between the conscious leadership skills and the systems and structures coming together, you could truly create anything to happen in the world. And as we're talking in the context of Transition US and also globally, you know, this is about we've got big work to do in the world. So we need emotional intelligence, we need conscious leadership skills, and we need really phenomenal systems and structures that are going to get this work done um, so that we can see it now. You know, it's not about, yes, it is about the next 50 years, the next 100, the next 1,000, but let's see what we can get done in the next five. Um, and so that's really what drew me to Holacracy. It's a very action-oriented way of working. So what I'm going to do is, if you have got a slide deck um, in front of you, um, I'm going to look into, you know, what are some of the um, endemic problems within organizations? So you've got a, a list here if they're in front of you. But all of us know the certain things that we've experienced. We've experienced painful meetings. We've experienced collaborative processes that actually don't end up in clear decision making. Uh, I don't think there's anyone on the planet that hasn't in the context of organization or any other context for that matter, um, experienced fear. Fear of, if I say this, if I do this, what are going to be the ne negative repercussions? So then people start playing politics. People start withholding information. People start working in ways that really are not functional. So one of the things that Holacracy is looking at is rather than saying, oh, okay, let's just do these simple quick fixes or let's give people better communication skills, Holacracy is looking at the underlying power structure that is driving a business. It's really taking that old industrial age way of doing business, 
very hierarchical, top-down decision-making, um, quite often very fear-driven, is taking that and instead of trying to tweak it, it is throwing it out the window altogether and it's saying how can we fundamentally structure in a new way that is truly going to get the work done. So as we think about um, one of the slides, I, I, you know, for anyone that, that um, if you go to slide number five, um, it's actually what is an organization. And to me, this slide is, is talking about what are all of the ways that we try to get around the actual existing structures in organizations. So let's think about a, a general, a traditional organization that has an organizational chart. And you've got somebody at the top, you've got a leader. And the question is, what's really driving their decision making? Is it actually some of the personal relationships that they have? Is it some of the, um, in family owned businesses, is it some of the family dynamics that's really driving decision making? Or is it truly how we need to get the work done? And that's what I want to do, is I want to support people in being able to fully live into who they are personally, like their personal um, way of doing what they do, but being able to, at the same time, separate that from the organizational purpose. Like the way that I want to work, that's my business. But it's actually separate from how do we need to come together and actually get the work done as an organization. So to maybe talk a little bit more clearly about that, quite often um, you'll have an organization that, you know, just even talking about my own, um, I think about the certain biases that I have, the certain preferences that I have. And if I actually get blindsided by my preferences and I make every decision in this organization based on those biases and preferences, I'm missing the boat to such a large degree. Meaning, if I'm somebody, and, and this is more generically speaking, if I'm somebody who really loves structure, and they're a quite rigid person, well then I'm obviously missing the boat on where I really need to be flexible and where we need to be adaptive. If I'm really hyper adaptive, then I actually might miss the boat on where do I actually need more structure, more processes. So that's why I truly believe it's about giving everyone a voice in the organization and not just in a town hall setting, giving them true power that relates to their roles, that relates to their responsibilities, so that they can show up in the work and really, as Caroline was saying in the beginning, have clear roles and make sure that those roles and those accountabilities are driven by those doing the work, not the all-powerful people at the top end of a structure. The thing I'm going to just talk a little bit about is how often, and specifically in nonprofit areas, uh, we, we think about organizations as collectives. We think of them as a collection of people doing the work. And what holacracy is stretching us all to really sense into is that the organization itself is actually somewhat a separate entity. It actually has its own purpose in the world separate from the people, even though it is the people's energy and passion that is energizing that purpose. But there is something that wants to happen in the world, whether it's you know, being able to resolve climate change issues, whether it's looking at um, you know, keeping fossil fuels in the ground. It, it doesn't matter what the issue is. There is something that the organization, what their purpose is, is actually the defining um, energy of that organization. And, and it is about for the people in the organization to truly put that purpose first. So it's about founders and leaders being able to um, separate from being able to, you've, you've initially put in that founder energy, whether it you know, was a, a local chapter, and it's very easy to be fused to the organization. 
uh, how many of us have been in situations where whoever started a nonprofit or whoever started a chapter is very possessive and, and really has a lot of ownership of that chapter in the beginning, which is phenomenal and required and needed to really birth this entity into the world. But there's a way that it becomes um, you know, too smothering and claustrophobic that, that that entity needs to grow separate from the actual egos and personalities of the people within the organization. And being able to really call out the organization as a separate entity that is through the people energizing the organization, continually sourcing, is this my purpose? Is, it, is there some way that we need to restructure? Is there some new way of, that we need to adapt to? What does the world really need at this moment? So really looking at, do you, do you, um, you, know, do you have a fusion with your own role within your organization? Or are you really able to energize that role fully in service of the purpose rather than in service of just exactly what you need? I'm going to look at the, um, really the overall of what holacracy is. And it's slide seven for anyone who's watching, who's looking at the slides. So holacracy is a governance system. It's a governance structure for organizations to be able to operate effectively. And when we're using the word governance in this context, we're talking about who makes what decisions, what policies are guiding the organization. So what are the, what are the ways that we are going to govern? Quite often in a normal situation or in a regular traditional organization, you know, governance is, is really the, the thing that the board looks at. But we're looking at governance of every single um, structure, meaning every single circle within the organization, every single function area, that they have such clear governance, such clear uh, who makes what decision, such clear roles, that we know exactly where work gets channeled. So that's one primary area. The other thing is, what I love is this, this place where holacracy is an integrative way, you know, where we integrate all the different perspectives of people. And we do that to distribute autocratic authority. So quite often people think about when everyone's putting their voice into the mix, when everyone has a way to integrate their perspective, People think it's more of a consensus um, decision-making, whereas what holacracy is about is giving individual roles autocratic authority, that they have the power to actually sit at their desk or do whatever they do, however they do their work, wander around the building as they create, and be able to make those autocratic decisions so that the work can get done at a much greater speed. So it really kind of drives that question of, well, how do you then collaborate? And that, that will be something I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more later in the presentation, or there may be questions about that. And then we're looking at the fact that this, the aspect of having a constitution, having a set of rules of the game that every single person in the organization is actually agreeing to work from. So for those of you, whether you played um, different sports, whether, you, uh, whether it was you played Monopoly, you know, whatever uh, activities you did growing up, we've all actually participated in structured um, activities that have rules of the game. So with Holacracy, there is a, a pretty uh, rigorous constitution of about 30 pages. And quite often what people, you know, they'll ask me in the very beginning when they start to practice holacracy is, well, you know, I, I just, I don't understand. What about this? What about that? What I would say is holacracy is a little bit like consciousness. It's actually a lifetime journey that you're going to deepen in your understanding of yourself, of your own consciousness, of the holacracy rules of the game, 
and how to effectively use the buttons and levers and different ways to um, get work done and to process any issues, um, it, that really deepens over time. But what I love about having a constitution is that everyone is abiding by that same set of rules. And obviously, the faster you learn the rules of the game, the more that you can truly participate in a, in a more active and uh, um, rewarding way for you and also the organization. And so for me, I look at it as if when I started to, I've played field hockey, I've, I've played many sports actually, um, and I didn't, I didn't, the first thing I, I did was grab hold of a hockey stick and start running. You know, I didn't necessarily know what the rules of the game were. And that's how I really encourage people to look at holacracy is if you are choosing to go in this direction, start playing, start seeing what it is to be in a holocratic organization, and then just learn the rules as you go. There's lots of resources on the website, um, you know, whether that's Holacracy One and, and our company Wonderworks is building a, a big wide variety of resources at this time as well. And so start playing if it's something you're interested in. Whether, um, the, the fun thing for me at this moment is it's very early days with Holacracy. I think that the organization itself, you know, the actual um, system and structure has been in effect, if you like, for the last six years. But in its current format, I would say that there's really the organization that has been practicing the longest is really only for about the last three years. Um, and that is David Allen getting things done. And they are out there. Um, they've you know, adopted Holacracy um, throughout their entire organization. And what I love is about the people that get attracted to Holacracy are really people that have somewhat done their homework, and I know that might sound like a bit of a self-serving um, statement, but it's my experience is that they've got to a point in their journey that they've looked at making sure they've got a good culture. They've looked at how do we communicate more effectively. They've looked at, I mean, you think about getting things done, they've got phenomenal individual, personal, organizational systems knowledge. And what they get to is, we really need to deal with how do we do power at work? How do we do power in organizations? Because the misuse of power is what really kills an organization. So what I get to do is there's a number of different organizations that are actually practicing now. And I would say I get to work with some of the coolest people on the planet because they are really mission and purpose driven. Um, I think about Pantheon Chemical. As a funny story, uh, you know, I remember last year and I, I was going through Salesforce.com within my company and I was de determining what are the classifications of companies that I would work with because there are some companies, uh, Petrochemical, you know, there was kind of this list I was going through. These are not the companies I'll be working with. And I physically deleted chemical as a category in my industries list in my Salesforce.com. And then, literally, within 30 days, I get a phone call from Pantheon Chemical. And have initially, I'm like, what? Pantheon, you know, what's that about? And what it was is they're an eco-chemical company. So I, you know, my limited way of thinking was not thinking in the direction of eco-chemical company. And so what I love is that the people who are at the cutting edge of their industries really get that they have to deal with this issue of having phenomenal systems and structures to ensure that they can truly live into these really big ideas that they um, that, that are their company's purposes. And so on that note, I'll go into some of the elements of holacracy. And um, one of the elements of holacracy is how do you get all the voices in the mix in the most effective way. Because we all know that sometimes the quietest voice is actually has got the, the, 
the absolute gem that we need to listen to in that given moment. So we want to make sure that we are truly one of the, the, the areas, one of the analogies is, is looking at that we're flying with all our instruments. You wouldn't want to be in an aircraft and actually ignore one of the lights or one of your indicator lights or one of the controls. You actually want to make sure that you can see every warning light and every single person in an organization is a warning light. They are an indicator to say, okay, should we course correct just to the right, to the left? Should we land right now because we've got no fuel? You know, what is it that each person in, or, in an organization is A, sensing, because so, it's really critical that each person in an organization can sense what's happening. And we do it automatically. I mean, we show up in work and we are feeling great doing our work or we are sensing there's a problem here or we're sensing, wow, there's an opportunity here. So one of the terms that um, is written throughout the Constitution and really embedded within holacracy is actually the term tension. And so the definition of tension from a holo holacracy standpoint is it is the specific gap between what is, like what currently is, the current situation, and the future potential. So the entire system of holacracy is driven by processing tensions. So to process a tension, firstly, you have to be able to sense a tension. You have to sense that gap between the current reality and a future potential. Then you have to say, okay, I sense this tension. Now what do I do with it? I need to process it. I need to take it somewhere. I need to have a conversation. And Holacracy has created a couple, well, actually three different meeting practices. So one aspect of Holacracy is it has three phenomenal meeting practices to go ahead and process tensions. But Holacracy, just to be really clear, is not three meeting practices. The actual work of Holacracy, in, it really is the, the outer bubble, it's the outer structure that actually runs all decision making within an organization. But quite often, you know, well actually I'll take that back, within an organization, I would say about 90% of the work, maybe more, gets done outside of the three holocratic meeting processes. You know, the work is got done on your everyday um, interacting with one person, three people, you, you doing your work on your own at your desk. That's the work. And that work is done within the context of holacracy. It is done where you have true power to be able to get work done. However, I've, I would say that most organizations and the most effective way to start practicing holacracy is to start practicing the, specifically I'll start with one of the meeting practices, so one of them is an operations meeting practice because so often we literally just need to get really clear next steps. We need to get really clear what are the projects that we need to be doing. So that's what we call a tactical meeting process. And it is literally to say, okay, what is the work? How do we need to get it done? Like what is this project? Who, who owns it? What's the next action step? So the tactical meeting process syncs people up operationally. So that's one meeting practice. The other meeting practice is governance. And governance, not, many or not, uh, not any organizational structures that I'm aware of, separate governance out and have a really clear process to actually decide who makes what decisions, to decide how are we actually governing the work that we're doing? How are we structuring the work we're doing? So I look at governance meetings as it's actually like a mini reorg every single month. So you have most organizations do monthly governance meetings per, I'm going to call them circles, so per um, 
Mm-hmm. I'll talk a little bit more about circles later, but um, but you could look at it as function areas, but it, it, it's it's a little bit different than a function area. Um, but basically, that governance meeting structure is to evolve who makes what decisions. It's to evolve policies. It's to evolve how you govern the organization. So these two separate meeting practices are ways you process tensions. The third one is a strategy meeting. I'm not going to talk much about that, um, but obviously strategy also needs to be evolved. But 90% of your tensions are going to be dealt with outside of those meetings. You're going to be going directly to the other person, the other role within the organization, and dealing with your tensions directly there. Or the other collection of people, if you need some brainstorming meeting, you have a tension around brainstorming, you're going to call um, you know, a mini brainstorming meeting and actually deal with your tension there. So the, the number one thing about processing tensions, because from my last 10 years looking at conscious leadership, I would say is the issue that tensions go underground. You know, it's a little bit like, you know, I, I always look at the saying, the elephant in the room. You know, the thing that nobody's actually talking about that's the most mission critical thing that we need to be facing. So this, this one aspect of Hoxie is what I would say is a centrally powerful engine to continually shine a light that gets brighter and brighter and brighter at what is the most important thing that my role or this circle of people need to be focused on. And so that really clear beam of light to make sure there are no elephants in the room, that we are actually talking about what truly needs to happen to get the work done. So I'm going to take a pause there for a moment and just double check to see if there are questions out there. And I'll check in with Caroline on that just to see, um, is, this a good, is this a good time? Yes, there are a couple of hands up. Um, let's first go to David Cutter. Um, David, go ahead. Yep, can you hear me? Yes, yes I can. I yep. uh, just wondered if you could say again, I'm assuming you said it already, uh, where these slides are. Yes, certainly. I'll leave that over to Caroline. Yes, they, um, I emailed a number of people yesterday who had registered by that time. And if you didn't get them through email, if you go to our website, our home page, um, and click on the Holacracy link, the same link that you registered for the course, at the bottom of that page that lists all the information about today's course, uh, there are three handouts. Okay, I'll go look there. I'm looking at my email and I'm not seeing it, but I'll go look. Thank okay, you. thanks, thanks David. David. And let's go to um, our next person is Steve Miller. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, hi, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I got a little okay. bit of a buzz, but we can hear you. Okay. Um, my question may be covered later, but it regards when you're building a structure like this or using a system like this, that uh, I would assume it requires a certain amount of self insight and maturity among the members. And so, how do you screen for that? Like when you're hiring or forming an organization, is there a standard kind of screening process by which you Try to ferret out these problems in advance of people who have their own agendas, and you know, but basically that's it. Yeah. yeah. Is there a screening process for being sure everyone's really starting close as possible to the same page? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great question. What I would say is, um, so I'd say the answer is simply that I have my own screening process, but. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what I think that screening process is. Um, for me, intuition is a really big aspect of, of, of who I personally am at my core. Um, so I will have an interviewing process with people to say, are they committed? Well, have they, A, is there a certain level of emotional maturity in the individual, in the applicant? So 
to me, emotional maturity is not a requirement for every single person who is operating within holacracy. However, the higher the emotional maturity, the faster that all of the work is going to get done. That's my opinion. Um, it's my experience, and it's also my opinion. So firstly, um, anyone who would be working at Wonderworks would be uh, emotional maturity is the absolute first indicator. And if I was going to put one measure on what I would say emotional maturity is, it is the willingness to accept feedback in the moment or as close to the moment as possible. Meaning, if I'm actually going to give someone feedback, I understand that they might get triggered by that, they might get defensive about that. But what I want them to do is to be able to say, um, you know, and this would be obviously operationally inside the building, is, okay, I notice that, you know, I'm, whether they use the word triggered, they use the word whatever, I notice that I feel really defensive about that, I notice that, you know, I want to argue with you about that. And so I want time to be able to be with that and let me come back to you and let me, you know, let's have that conversation later. I want that ability that somebody is open to learning as a part of their life journey. And I'm talking about Wonderworks. I'm not talking about hol holacracy right now. Meaning for the organization of Wonderworks, openness to learning is a requirement. Um, because to me, to bring transformational practices out into the world, you better have done an enormous amount of your own transformational journey. So firstly on screening, emotional maturity. And for me, openness to learning is, the, is the, that, that piece. Um, secondly on screening, obviously, does somebody actually, do they have the ability to do the job? You've got all the abilities to actually screen for that. And then I think that having, someone having their own agenda, to me, I believe that that is really about, is somebody firstly purpose-driven, um, and you know, that's very debatable, meaning is the purpose for their own personal purpose, or is the purpose for what really wants to happen in the world? And let's face it, we both have both. You know, we've got our own personal agenda, if you like, because even the most pure um, purpose for an organization, there will be some ego needs that are being fed at the same time. Um, you know, I think pulling those two apart the whole time, again, that's a life journey. That doesn't happen overnight. So for me, the issue of screening, because I've done an, an enormous amount of interviewing over my you know, whole career, I would say the first thing is, do they have the skills? And the second thing is, do they line up with the culture of the organization? And now, when you have a holocratic organization, that culture, there is, there's a bit of a shift in it because there is a shift to taking on autocratic power in every single role. So the holocratic screening is, does somebody actually want to grow their ability to take on autocratic power, or are they convinced that consensus building is the only way forward? Because if somebody is committed to consensus building, they're more than likely going to struggle within an autocratic environment because consensus building takes longer. And somebody that's putting holacracy in is saying a couple of things. They're saying, we really trust people to do their work. And we trust that if it goes a little sideways, that we can actually simply dynamically steer it. We can simply adjust course. And so there's got to be a much greater level of tolerance for iterating forward. And, you know, it, to me, it's like, you know, some people call it failing fast. I don't see it as failing. I see it more as, um, you know, you're getting new data in and you, you're now making more refined decisions based upon that new data. But whatever you want to call it, I think you're, it's that, that ability to take in information, make a decision, get new data, make a decision. In all honesty, it's no different than um, openness to learning inter internally on a personal side. It's about make a decision, get new feedback, make another one, get new feedback, and you iterate forward. 
So for me, people who are heavily on the control freak side, they have to have a stated commitment to shifting their control freakness. It's not that control freaks not need, you know, don't apply. It's just that you've got to know that that's, a, that's an issue that is your personal area of growth. So the way I look at it is the screening is do they have a stated goal that getting the work done is more important than processing their own personal stuff? Because holacracy and holocratic structures are really putting a focus on getting the work of the purpose of this organization done over you processing your own personal stuff. You processing your own personal stuff is you know, a journey between you and your therapist, I could say, on the harshest side of things. Um, but what I truly believe is that um, if you have, you know, you might have internal coach roles that can support people, um, you know, there's all sorts of ways to do it inside the organization as well as outside the organization. But what I would say is the, major the vast majority, 90% of the resources of the organization, 95% of the resources of the organization are getting the purpose completed. It's getting the work of the organization done. And yes, you need to support people to grow because obviously that's going to get the work done. Um, but it's really looking at that orientation. And so that would be my screening process. So long answer maybe, but I think it's a really critical, critical area. Because if you don't get the right people in the building, you're going to be moving slow. When you get the right people on the train, you can become, instead of a train, a rocket ship. And with some of the goals that I know that this community and I know that I have, um, we need uh, we need solar powered rocket ships right now, um, or that's what I would prefer to see. Maybe that's more accurate. So, were there any other hands popping up there? There, there are a few more. Did you want to take a few more questions? There's five hands up. Yeah, I would say because I think that we're actually more than likely covering off on everything else. And I'd okay. much rather take people's questions than just talk about, um, you know, something out of context. Okay. Uh, so uh, next is Clayton Horsey. Go ahead. Hey, can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Or good morning, I guess. Um, the question, so I just, um, I believe Steve was the person who asked the question that you just responded to. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay, so what if I heard your answer correctly, you were talking about your personal screening system. Yes, I did, but yeah. I, I think the question was, does holarchacy have a, a tool or a, a particular a structure in place for screening people? I don't know if Steve said this, but my question is, does holacracy have something in place for this type of process of screening or even ferreting out when egos are getting involved in uh, various decisions that are being made once the holacracy system is in place? Oh, okay. Yeah, so firstly, um, I would say the shortest answer is no, they don't have a, a screening system that is out there as a kind of app, if you like, on this operating mm -hmm. system. The one thing that they have created, and I would totally um, support and endorse and, and suggest people to use, is having a process and structure. So they, you know, they have their own process and structure of how they hire people. And the way I look at that is, um, you know, and, and so do we, and so do all the organizations running Holacracy. There's no official app, but I would say un the underpinning is having a, um, you know, to me it's having a simple question to say, do they fit the culture? You know, does this person fit the culture? And therefore the number of interviewers would rate that, whether it's one to five, whatever system you would um, do from a rating scale. But it's literally making it data-driven to say, yes, they fit the culture. Um, do they fit the skill set? Do they fit the requirements of holacracy of you know, less on the control side, more on the autonomy side? I think it's really a system of uh, three basic questions that you're going to then have a certain number of roles that are the interviewers that would then rank those people on those questions. 
and therefore you'd get out an answer to say, you know, yes, you know, this person is um, is a minimum number that they've had to receive, say, a rating of um, over four if it's uh, one is low, five is high. You know, the mm -hmm. actual the answer no is that there's no this is the system. There are mm -hmm. just some good ideas out there that everyone then, you know, everyone running Holoxy is to evolve into what makes sense for you. Because the thing about Holoxy is once you look at the Constitution, they are the rules of the game. But outside of that, every organization gets to build the apps that will truly resonate with their culture as opposed to one size fits all, which, uh, you know, as we all know, you know, does, doesn't work. I don't know, does that answer your question, Clayton, or was there a second part to it? You got it. Thank you. Excellent. I appreciate that. And I'm wondering, too, um, Anna, how that works with more of the grassroots um, organization that is really calling everyone to the table. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe in, in some of your responses to, to sort of address how, how it might look in sort of that grassroots um, and do you mean volunteer when you say grassroots? Just so I can yeah, like, like the transition, like the transition yeah, initiatives exactly. are really inviting volunteers to step forward and give their gifts and get involved and participate and basically transform their locale. Yeah. So, um, can, and, can I answer that right now? Because yes. I, I really think that this is the critical. I've worked. I've volunteered in many organisations. Pachamama Alliance uh, was a facilitator for seven plus years, and and, and lots of different nonprofits and. I think that the issue of, um, and I'm going to you know, say some things that I believe, and they're kind of um, generalizations that could trigger all sorts of people, but my experience of me and people that I've volunteered with is that we come to the table with an enormous amount of energy and passion, and all of our own stuff is so swirled up in the mix of what we're trying to get done in the world. So one of the, and this is not about holocracy, this is actually about the transformational work that I do, um, which, um, you know, I, as I say, I studied with the Hendricks Institute. Um, for who, actually, here's a poll question. Uh, can I do a poll even though there's question, hands up, or will that mess with that, Carolyn? Well, let's, let's Carolyn. not use the number one for the poll because we can keep those people with their right. hands up who haven't uh, been called on yet. And for those people that that do have their hands up with, with having press number one, you know, just relax. We'll get a good sense from this poll anyway. And yeah, and, and so I'll get shorter on my answers. And I will also go, uh, just a poll question number five, hit number five. If you have heard of either the Karpman Triangle, meaning hero, victim, and villain, some people call it the Bermuda Triangle, um, you know, so has, who has heard of the Cartman Triangle or the model of hero, victim, villain. Some people call it persecutor and whatever and whatever. Um, so if you press five to say you have, uh, just so I can get an idea about the audience, that would be great. Looks like there's, um, whoop, the keep, number keeps going up. Uh, looks like there's uh, 15 people on the call who have. Yeah, so, okay, great. So we've got about 20-odd percent. So what I would say is, when I think about this issue of volunteers, it's every organization, but specifically with volunteers, we have a little bit of a tendency that we come to the, uh, this work with either some hero persona, like how can I save the world, or some villain persona of, oh my God, those evil Dow Chemical people or those evil Exxon Mobil or you know, whatever it is, we come with that villain energy. Um, or we come with the victim energy of, oh, my goodness, my family are being, you know, toxic overload because of da-da-da-da. And so there's hero, victim, and villain. And underneath all of those, or embedded within all of those, is the pure essence of what is it that we most want. And I think the work of uh, leaders in Transition USA is, is really supporting people to be able to pull those two things apart and to notice when they go hero, victim, or villain, because what that does is it derails us from being the most powerful transformational people we can be in the world. So to me, that's the shortest answer is, 
yes, you're pulling your ego apart from the actual work that needs getting done. But I love the work of um, Hendricks Institute's really done a, you know, really deepened into this work around hero, victim, and villain. And it is, A, it's fun work, B, it's transformational, and C, we get really redirected into what is it we most need to do in the world, and we actually can get to that work a lot faster. And so that's what I would really say Holacracy supports that. It supports pulling apart our personal, our ego, our preference needs, and it really gets you focused on here's the actual purpose of our community, our, you know, whatever the um, area that we're, we're actually focused on. And let's make sure we're focused on that and not getting derailed by the hero, victim, villain, persona stuff. So that's something I would say uh, is really a why I love Holacracy because it supports that transformational shift in people if it's called out. If you don't call it out, then it obviously, you know, it takes longer to, to really attack that. So another, another question. Wow, wonderful. Thank you. Um, let's go. I think some of you did change your, your hands. So, um, you know, if you, if you did have a question, do press 1 on your keypad. We'll go to um, Sylvie Sprockman. Go ahead. Hi. I was wondering um, what are some good resources for people who want to, yeah, just dive in and, and try things out? What would be a really good place for people to start? Brilliant. Yeah, so I would, A, I would look at the two uh, meeting, process handouts, meeting process handouts that I sent. From my point of view, um, start practicing. Start with tactical. It's easy. Um, go on in the next, uh, I would say in the next six weeks, go on holoxy1.org. They've got videos and material out the wazoo. You just cannot have, you know, there, I I cannot say enough about the resources. They're brilliant. Um, the, re the only reason we, WonderWorks, are going to be really creating a lot of resources as well is truly because um, I would say the two organizations have got very different personalities. Like mine you know, is very much embedded in conscious leadership, and, and so therefore there's a different voice, a different tone, a different way of expressing basically the same material. And so that's really our focus of putting that other voice out there. But they've got brilliant material. So I would start with tactical, play with it, go on there, look at a governance meeting process. Um, there's a video, and then dive in, start governance. Uh, you could even go on the community of practice to ask questions. Um, uh, what I'm looking to do is actually is to get people like you practice, practicing, and then maybe do I don't know, like a monthly or a six-week call where, you know, one evening a month that we, uh, you know, five or six o'clock, we get together and we answer questions. Because I know you can't afford to actually hire me as a consultant. You know, I'm not saying you personally. I'm just saying this community is about volunteerism and it's about getting this work done. So I'm totally open for thoughts on that as well. And I can follow up with um, Maggie or Caroline about that afterwards. So we'll go with the next question, though. But thanks, Sylvie. Uh, wonderful. That's exciting. Yes, I'm happy to talk further about that. And also people could email me ideas as well um, based on what you've just said, um, Anna. The next person is William Faith. So go ahead, William. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, two, two quick questions, if I may. Uh, firstly, um, obviously, the Holacracy five-day workshop is for you know uh, small organizations. It is prohibitively expensive. Uh, so I was wondering, in larger organizations, is it the kind of thing where you could send one delegate to learn this process and then sort of bring it back to dispense that into the community, rather than having everyone um, have you know put in that kind of outlay uh, yep. to do that? And then secondly, um, on the back of that, just a question about the Holacracy Constitution. I'm uh, uh, just wondering if that's a template that your organization uses and modifies to their own needs, or if that is a separate document to the own constitution that you would create. And okay, uh, that's, right. that's everything for me. Thanks. So I do, Holacracy for, I do the Constitution first. So the Holacracy Constitution, um, what my statement would be is use this for a year without editing anything. Um, because what happens is the thing you edit is generally the thing that's your preference. 
And therefore, the other people with the opposite preference get thrown out the window in that moment. So I get people to really practice for a year until they truly have it embodied and that they can see what is, what's their learning edge, their personal learning edge, and what is it that truly is something they need to change for their organizational structure that serves the purpose. So that would be my two seconds on that, or whatever, 30. Um, PCT, so practitioner certification training. Yes, it, you know, it's expenses. Uh, you know, I get that. Um, it's very powerful, five-dayer. Um, I would do exactly what you said. If you can afford to send one person, you can go that route. Um, the other option is get a few people to go to a one-dayer, um, get practicing. You know, we do local one-dayer workshops, uh, introductory. You can get a few people practicing. They can watch things on the website. They can deepen their practice that way. Um, but I do think the, the five-day obviously goes into such enormous detail um, that does really support a facilitator to facilitate the meetings. So I would look at your budget and see what makes sense. Great. Thank you uh, for that. And yeah, let's go to me. Antoine. Okay. All right. Hi, thank you. I have, uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first question is about the um, – I just kind of needed a nuts and bolts kind of understanding about this um, autocratic authority because it seems like there's the possibility that auto autocratic authority might work against the evolutionary purpose of the organization. And so the concrete example that I'm thinking about is, um, so there's a person who's sensing a tension in the organization and they're from department Y and they bring this up to person in Department Z, they're something that they are seeing or think they're seeing, and the person that they bring it up to in Department Z says, um, okay, thanks a lot for your opinion. Uh, we're not going to do that. <laughs> and, and that right might be person Z's thing, you know, that they, that they are not interested. And so, you know, I, I'm not quite sure how autocratic yeah, autonomy – yeah, exactly. So that's my first question. And the second question is whether um, holacracy I, – I really appreciated the thing about um, working with volunteer organizations. And um, I, I'm curious about whether you really need uh, to use this for a, a rather mature organization as opposed to a forming organization, particularly a forming volunteer organization. Great. Love the two questions. So firstly, checks and balances. So if you go to person Y and they say no, um, what we have in Holoxy is we have a double link-in process. And I know I can't really go into that in detail at this moment. But each circle, so each um, function area, say it's a group of 6, 8, 10, 12 people, they will have a lead link who has the accountabilities of prioritizing work if two people have got a debate about what they need to prioritize, they have the accountability of assigning people into roles in that circle, and they also have resource allocation. Now, those authorities can be distributed you know, in a governance meeting, but that's basically what their role is. You also have a rep link, which is an elected position, and that rep link will actually represent the whole circle and they will represent that into the broader circle. So say if there is a general organizational circle and then there are sub-circles, then if a sub-circle, if two sub-circles are having a debate, they will be able to channel, you know, the rep link can channel uh, tensions up to the broader circle. The bottom line is the lead link of the general circle is actually um, – they have the accountability of prioritizing the work to get the purpose done. So I'm going to just so that's the double linking process. So there are checks and balances, and there are multiple routes to process tensions. So that if a decision gets made that is not safe enough to try, that does harm the organisation. That there are ways to process those tensions. I know there's a lot more to say on that, but I'm going to be that brief just because of the others right now. Now, you had said. A volunteer organization that's forming. The other, so I'd say what I would say about that is I'm just actually 
uh, forming um, the Bay Area Conscious Capitalism Group because I actually think that, to me, I think that where my energies are best utilized is in transforming capitalism, which I've always thought as kind of like, um, you know, I've in my career felt it was a dirty word. And I think that, to me, there is so much happening in the world of work, in the world of paid organizations that are driving forward enormous change that they need to be able to transform at an enormously fast rate and that means transforming leadership and structures in those organizations so long story short so i'm uh, in the forming stages of that and we are starting to utilize holacracy practices i personally think it is brilliant for starting organizations um that's all I can say is because the role clarification, you know, really putting it out there, whose role's what, who's got what decision-making power, it actually, who is volunteer coordinator, what, you know, what does that mean? I think that it really takes so much of the, like, no, 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 fighting, who's doing, it takes all that out of the picture. So if it's a mature organization, it's great. If it's a starting organization, it's great. If it's a merging organization, it's great. The big issue is, do you have people who are committed to it and want to do it? Because I'm not saying it's the only way. It's just the only way that I want to function in an organization. Um, so that's maybe not the fullest answer, but I'm going to leave it at that for now. Uh, thanks, Antoine. Great. Um, next is Kathy Ehlers. Go ahead. Yes, hi. Um, the question that I had when I pressed one has been answered, but another one has arisen in the meantime. Right. And it's it's maybe something that you could point me to some resources on. Um, my question is, how do we deal with the huge cultural tension over listening to and acknowledging women's leadership? Right. Okay, great. Um, so how do we deal with the huge cultural tensions about list, like really getting women's voices in there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. And yeah. Especially with regard, especially with regard to the autocratic um, power over a certain segment yeah. of the work. Yeah. 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 So the first, well, the way I go after it is, so how do we? Um, I want the women in those positions. You know. Um, and I personally, because my partner and I would have many conversations about this, um, I really believe that unless women and conscious men, so conscious women and conscious men, because there are amazingly unconscious women and amazingly unconscious men as well, but I'm talking about conscious women and men who are committed to building their awareness, so that's what I mean by consciousness, um, putting those people in leadership positions and having systems and structures that are actually taking out the ego-driven, unaware, unconscious leaders. And I don't care whether they are women or men. That's my position. My partner would be banging the table and saying, hey, we need more women. And I agree we need more women. But I just want to be clear on what my belief is about it. It is about consciousness. And I do believe women... You know, if you if you look at it, the empathy quotient, the emotional intelligence quotient, the nurturing quotient, and the hard driving get business results quotient too. Whether they are nonprofit um, work results or business results, it's all business, it's all work. I don't see it as any different. My my world has merged to such a degree that I can't even see the difference. But how do we do that? You've got to get a people in the positions that they are most talented for. Sometimes that is women needing to realize how valuable they are and stepping up and stepping into situations to take on autocratic power, meaning owning their own autocratic power. Instead of being nice and friendly and polite, that skill is outdated and no longer useful. Because nice and friendly and polite is not going to get the work of Transition USA done. Now, I believe in communicating effectively and having great cultures. Um, you know, I, I'm passionate about that. But 
I'm talking about the persona of nice and friendly and polite. That persona, hero, victim, villain, is not doing us any good. And women need to actually grow their they need to grow beyond their learning edges, the same way men do. So I think the work is of the women individually to transform themselves and then collectively put forward and process their tensions in whatever way, shape, or form, inside or outside holacracy. Process tensions to get the work done. And we all know, we're activists, that doesn't matter whether you're marching on or whether you're going up and speaking to somebody individually. You need to continue saying what you believe in, and then you need to surround yourself with people who think like you so you can have the power and the energy collectively to be able to take on some of these challenges. And so there is a very, there's a collective of energy that is required, but then there's a separate thing of organizational entities and what their governance are. So I'm kind of merging two things there because this question is, is a little bit more personally driven in you know from my point of view but i do think it's us individually stepping up and as um van jones said uh, and i love this quote is grow your goddamn comfort zone and um i think that that's what i challenge myself to do every day is grow it anna because it won't happen unless you do i know we've got two questions five minutes so i'm going to end there kathy but thank you yes thank you and we we do i was going to point that out too that we have a few minutes left um, Janice Lynn if you could be concise and you're on thank you well that's synchronistic because uh, my question centers around a split in my group where the uh, founders are hanging on to um, well they're they're the ones that aren't aren't really doing the work they're they're mainly building an organization where um, some other people, including myself, are actually doing the work. And um, I'm about to throw in the towel with the whole group after like two years of really putting a lot of energy into it, kind of like you talked about the hero. But in this situation, I've come to a dead end. I don't really see any way out except to, like you say, just take my power and do what I want and not worry about what what we call the initiating group, which is not doing anything. So do you have any uh, <laughs> insight? Yeah, or? yeah I, I think my, what I've really learned over time is that um, I have a little giggle, initiating group, sorry. Um, so what I've learned over time is you've got to follow what your gut says. And I am a real peace, I come from a real peacekeeping, you know, that would be the personas that would have held me back in life. And yes, they were great personas, but you've got to go beyond it. You know what you want to do in the world. And some of the decisions you make might be a little bit, you know, ish. Uh, we all make decisions that aren't brilliant. But you've got to move the agenda forward, and you've got to find people who are inspired about doing the work. And you, you know, to me, it's going up to the initiating group, and it's to say the 10-second communication, like what is it? I don't think that you're initiating or I don't feel the, the workers are actually who are doing the work are actually even heard here. We don't have two-way communication. Get down to what is the 10-second truth, your truth, that you want to share with them and then see what emerges from that. But don't leave before you've actually had that most forthright conversation. And it might be a few conversations, but always what is the 10-second communication that is really the thing you haven't shared and maybe you have wow thank you and uh final one i do see other people with um hands up with different numbers and we won't be able to get to um others we've got one more and that'll be tina clark go ahead tina hi anna thank you so much this is fascinating i wondered if you could say a bit more about i mean i do think you've put the nail on the head that our transition groups are often people who want to come together for positive, for friendship, for um, you know, a good a good feeling of community, maybe security and and fun in their lives. And so we've we've really emphasized that that really positive side. Um, I I wonder if you could say a bit more about how we get people to a level of um, 
of honesty and and commitment to relationship to yeah. to get through if holacracy can help us building those relationships because sometimes we focus a lot on tasks um and we focus on niceness right and we don't really want to do the the relationship work of hanging in there with each other's learning curves and what yeah. if you could talk about that yeah absolutely so firstly Community is essential. I love community. I love friendship. I love all of that. That is what we call tribe space. It's where the tribe is getting together as equals outside of roles, outside of the company. You know, it could be in the company but, or outside the nonprofit in the community. It's tribe space. There are no roles there. That work is important. Have a role that schedules those things. Inside the, doing the work, this issue of how do you get people to be honest, that's my life's work. <laughs> my whole work is about authenticity, and Holacracy just helps it. But you know what? Holacracy will not get you there because your inner, your inner fear that says, I will not say that thing to the initiating group, or your inner courage that says, I will say that thing to the initiating group, that's the thing. That is the work of our life, I think, is to leave this planet where you've said every single thing that you wanted to say, that you took every action step you wanted to take, so you did your work in this world. And truly, there's no answer. There's no quick answer to this one. You know, um, I think that, you know, uh, Tina, I, I think that how do you model it yourself is the only way that I know. So how do you personally go into your group and say, I think we're polite, I love you all, but I'd really love us to be a bit more direct and honest, or I'd love us to be rigorously honest, or whatever that is. So I know I need to end, but it is start with you and work it out from there. Oh, thank you so much, Anna. Um, I can see that this is the, the tip of the iceberg. There's so much to learn. It is um, quite the system, and I'd love to follow up with you on some of those ideas that you had, um, if there are people that come together to work with it, and maybe we can host um, some more time with you to dive more deeply into uh, specific questions around the process as well. And yeah. just to remind people, um, Holacracy One website for lots of good info, and WonderWorks is Anna's uh, uh, organization uh, with lots of great resources there as well. And um, just thank you so much, Anna, for joining us today, and look forward to to um, other other steps that we might unfold together. Great. I love what your group is doing. I feel passionate and 100% aligned, and that's why I'm a part of it. And I think this might be my best contribution to the group um, that lines up with my purpose. So thank you for this, and I know I'm over time, and therefore it's a broken agreement, and integrity is important. But thank you very much. <laughs>